open up with open up the sky and invite Jesus in. seated if you'd like. I see a crimson stream with so many people sick, so many people going through stuff. We need to remember to sing about the blood.
Be seated if you'd like. We're going to take up the offering now. Hallelujah. 
Thank the Lord for his presence that is here tonight. I love being in God's house. I love feeling what we're feeling right now. Amen. You can be seated here tonight. It is great to see everyone here together in God's house once again. And it's great to see a good group of Ikarangas here tonight. God bless them. And good to see Phoebe tonight. Haven't seen her in a long time and glad that she's here with us. Amen. Amen. Great. Awesome. Uh, just a few quick announcements, and we're going to move on to God's Word here tonight. Remember, this coming Tuesday night is our small groups. Light groups will be taking place, and, uh, of course, our uh, practice, play practice following that. And uh, watch, those of you that are part of the play, watch the group chat, because uh, Michaela will be designating what scenes we'll be going over in that practice, and then also uh, some information about additional practices so we can get tuned up for December the 8th, which is the Christmas concert and is the time when that play is going to go live. And so, anyway, good things to look forward to. Pentecostals of Renfrew coming up and uh, a lot of good things. We'll talk to you more about other things happening in December here shortly. Uh, you know, like Christmas, you probably weren't thinking about that one. But anyway, I do remember uh, on that note, Chris is for Christ and we want to give our best gift to the Lord. Amen. And so I'll talk to you more about that as we move ahead, but um, looking forward to, well, I don't want to jump ahead to December because there's good stuff that God has yet to do in the month of November, and we want to seize that day, and that uh, seizing that day is a good kind of segue into what I'm going to talk to you about here tonight, and I have a word that I, I pray will both encourage and challenge us here tonight as we as we strive to get the most out of our walk with God, our relationship with God, the most out of this life that he has given us, that God would help us with that. And so why don't you stand with me for the reading of God's word. We're going to turn to the gospel according to Matthew, Matthew 26, and uh, start reading at verse 6 here tonight, Matthew 26, and beginning at verse 6. It says, And when Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him, having an alabaster flask of a very costly fragrant oil, and she poured it on his head as he sat at the table. But when his disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? For this fragrant oil might have been sold for much and given to the poor. But when Jesus was aware of it, he said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, but me you do not have always. For in pouring this fragrant oil on my body, she did it for my burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. And tonight... I want to look at this and some of the other gospel accounts of this particular event and talk to you on the subject, Missing the Extraordinary for the Mundane. Missing the Extraordinary for the Mundane. We're going to look to the Lord right now in the name of Jesus. God, I ask you would speak to us right now. Lord, you have a work to do in this room. And God, you have been, Lord, dealing with my heart all week, Lord Jesus. Uh, God, I have felt your presence, your spirit, God, as I have prepared uh, for this sermon here tonight, God. And so I know you've got a work to do uh, in speaking to our hearts, Lord. Uh, I pray that you would imprint something on our spirit, uh, God, that would challenge us and change us, Lord. Uh, God, that we would have have a richer, more full life, Lord. Uh, you promise life more abundantly, uh, and you've got bigger and greater things for us. Uh, and I pray, God, that we would seize those moments, uh, seize those opportunities, I pray, and not squander, Lord, uh, this precious time you have given us. Help us, O oh Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated here tonight. I do want to say uh, as a just a response to um, I preached a few weeks back challenging you to to make that extra effort in being in our Sunday night and Tuesday night services. And I am thankful I have seen a uptick in attendance and I recognize those of you that are making an extra effort. I want to say thank you and honor you for your obedience. And I believe God's going to honor you by giving you some great blessings in these services. 
The story that we have read in our text here tonight of a woman coming with the alabaster flask to anoint Jesus is a fascinating one. This event comes just about a week before Calvary takes place. The various Gospels give different accounts, different perspectives on this event, and they either add or omit certain details to emphasize different things. That's the nature of the gospel accounts in general. That if you look at them and you examine them, you find that there are subtle nuances and influences that come. Like four different reporters on the scene and they all see and report on slightly different details of things that they see. In the case of Matthew, he emphasizes the vessel. It was an alabaster flask, and if you're not familiar with alabaster, it is a soft stone that can be shaped, and it is valued for this kind of application because it was an impervious barrier for something very costly, very precious. And the uh, this woman, the way that she accessed it is rather than just unstopping the, the cork out of the top of the alabaster flask, she broke it open. She made up her mind there's no holding back anything, but she broke broke the neck on that and so that she could pour not just a little trickle, typically something this precious, as we'll see in just a moment, you would try to use very, very minutely. It's concentrated, it's powerful, and it's exceptionally expensive. And so typically you would try to use it with like the little eyedropper type effect, but in this case she was all in and she broke the neck of that alabaster flask and uh, she began to pour, anointing his head and Jesus said his body with it as it ran down. Now in John's gospel, if we flip over there, we see a little bit of a different perspective. In John 12 and 1, it says, Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus, who had been dead, whom he raised from the dead, there they made him a supper, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary, we get the identity of this previously nameless woman, she took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance. Of the oil. But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This, he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box and he used to take what was put in it. But Jesus said, Let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you have with you always, but me you do not have always. So John shows us the identity of this woman, Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus, and that she not only anointed his head, but anointed his feet with this costly spike nard, and then dried, wiped his feet dry with her hair. Uh, now to give you an idea of the value of this, uh, we, we see a, a, a value given by the, the treasurer, the accountant in the group, and that was Judas. And he said that this could have been sold for 300 denarii. Well, 300 denarii, um, just to give you an idea, a denarii, a single denarii was a day's wage at that point. So you're talking about nearly a year's salary. The average annual salary in Canada right now is right over $70,000. So it means that this woman's gift, Mary's gift on this night, was worth well in excess of $60,000. It was an expensive act of worship. And in both Gospels, the reaction is the same. One, if not more, of the disciples. And we see here from John that Judas was the ringleader, but other disciples were in the same headspace as him. Like, what, what in the world? What, a, what a, a wasteful, extravagant moment to dump all this out, something so precious, in one excessive demonstration towards Jesus. There was nothing that was practical about this, and they noted that this could have been sold at great value and distributed to the poor. We could have been very effective in our ministry and reaching out to many poor people through this. The practical course in their minds would be to sell such an expensive commodity and use it for ministry to the poor. And let me just pause right there and say this just as a, as a practical aside. It's always easy to spend somebody else's money. 
The truth of the matter is it doesn't really matter what the disciples thought should have been done with this money. It wasn't theirs to spend. It was hers to give. They had no control over it. Sometimes people like to get involved in other people's sacrifice and say, you know, this, you shouldn't do this or you should do that. The truth of the matter is, is that this was Mary's to give. But in their minds, they're thinking, it's not like this is a group that often, ever, maybe, had a lot of money. This could revolutionize their ministry opportunities. Think of all that they could do in reaching out to the poor with this amount of money. And then we see from John's account, John gives us a little insight that Judas was the accountant of the group. He was the one that carried the shared money pouch and probably typically paid for things. And John notes as an aside that Judas... He was skimming off the top and would help himself to what was in the, the common purse. And John says it really wasn't about the poor at all. It was He was thinking about having the control of maybe the first big sum of money the group had ever had. This pretty much blew Judas' mind. How could blowing all of this priceless spikenard in one setting make any kind of sense? I don't often empathize with... Judas, but I have to confess that I can easily identify with his, with his thought process here. This is the opposite of practical. It feels a little impulsive, even wasteful. You could argue it was a poor distribution of resources. You could argue that, but you'd be wrong. How do I know that? Because of Jesus' reaction. That's not how Jesus interpreted it. He did not see it as wasteful. He did not see it as excessive. He didn't see it as impulsive. He recognized that Mary actually was operating on a deeper, deeper level of spiritual understanding than what the rest of the group was. Jesus had tried again and again to communicate to them what was about to happen. They were literally at the beginning of the Passion Week and he was trying to communicate to them that he would suffer and that he would die and that things were about to change. And It's like it wouldn't compute into their minds. But Mary had intuited what his disciples seemed incapable of grasping. She understood that his death Death, uh, was rapidly approaching uh, and she had one opportunity to do something extraordinary uh, for the one who is about to give us uh, the most extraordinary of gifts. Uh, what gift could be too big in exchange for the one who would purchase us eternal life? What value could you place on eternal life? Certainly more than 300 denarii more than a year's wage, more than a lifetime of wages. And Jesus made a comment in this moment to the critics who argued that the costly nard should have been sold and the pores, the proceeds distributed to the poor. And he said something, and that's one thing that the Gospels consistently report is this statement that Jesus made. And it's a comment that has lingered in my spirit for years. For different applications. John 12, 8 says, For the poor you have with you always, but me you do not have always. The statement says a lot. It tells us that in this life, until Jesus comes to rule and reign upon the throne of this earth, that there are certain problems that are never going to be solved. Not by your favorite politician. Not by the biggest corporations. Not by the most generous of charities. There are certain problems in this world that are just not going to be solved. We're not going to end poverty. No matter what Miss Universe says. It's all she wants. In world hunger. In poverty. Sure, honey. It's not going to happen. We're not going to end pain. We're not going to end brokenness. That doesn't mean that we should stop trying to minister to the poor and the broken. It just means that realistically we have to understand that this is going to be a lifelong pursuit. 
that you can make small gains here and there, and you can help people along the way, but as a systemic problem, you're never going to solve it. The poor are always with you. We can make a difference, but we can't solve the problem. Jesus was giving us a realistic look at life, and that is that in life, in ministry, there are certain jobs that you're never going to be done with. Tomorrow, there are going to be more of the same challenges. Uh, I'm going to preach an amazing sermon to you right now, uh, and it's going to fix all your problems. And then you're going to break tomorrow with a whole new set of problems. And I'll be praying, God, I need direction once again. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord, to say what these broken people need. Because that's the reality of life. Tomorrow, there will be fresh challenges. There is an endless cycle of problems to be solved, of challenges to be met. Such is life. You get all the laundry done today, but unless you're doing it naked, the clothes on your very back are going into the laundry basket at the end of the day. You can cut the lawn and bow it. Wow, it looks great. But that grass is already growing towards the next time it will need to be cut. I walk away from Mandy's with my hair looking fantastic. But just give it a few weeks and it's going to look like garbage again. Jesus was telling us that those mundane moments, those tasks that keep coming back and back and back again, they'll always be there. Distributing to the poor, there will always be more poor that need help. Mowing the lawn, there will always be more grass to cut. Getting the groceries, unless you're going to fast this week, you're going to have to go grocery shopping again. Washing the floors, and unless you learn how to walk on air, you're going to dirty them up again. The poor are always with you. There's stuff in life, jobs, that you can't do them once and for all. You do them now, and you'll need to do them again tomorrow, and the day after that, and the day after that. It's what we're calling the mundane here tonight. The mundane moments will always be there. But Jesus says the extraordinary moments are few and far between. The poor will always be there and will always have needs. But Jesus says, in this special moment, this little window you have with me, this is soon going to be passed. Uh, In less than a week, Jesus would go to the cross. uh, And things would never quite be the same after that. Uh, Thank God for the infilling of his spirit. uh, And I am so thankful for that and for his presence uh, that is with me. Uh, But I sure would have loved uh, to have the opportunity that these disciples did in this moment. uh, To be able to be walking and talking with Jesus uh, and spending these beautiful moments with him, uh, watching him in action, uh, hearing the lessons that he taught. Uh, But Jesus says, uh, I'm not always going to be with you in the same way. This was a singularly extraordinary moment. And Jesus says, you all think that something else should have happened today. But I'm telling you that what happened right now will be remembered forever around the world as a memorial to this woman for her sacrifice and her extravagant love. One of the most popular worship songs of the past 20 plus years is called Alabaster Box. It's actually written by one of our United Pentecostal ministers, Sister Janice Sostram. It was made popular by C.C. Winans and recorded by many others. And this song It continues to just resonate with people because it celebrates this moment that Jesus said will always be remembered uh, as a memorial to this woman. Uh, It is an extraordinary moment that has been celebrated uh, for thousands of years at this point. It has inspired millions of other people uh, to become more extravagant with their praise, uh, to be more sacrificial with their giving. Uh, They read about this this account, uh, and they realize, I can give them better worship. Uh, I can give them better offerings. Uh, I can give more of myself uh, because they're inspired by what this woman did. 
The value of this extraordinary moment is incalculable. And the disciples wanted to squander it for yet another mundane act of charity. They could have done exactly what they said. And it would have inspired, well, almost nobody. Because remember, they're spending somebody else's money. That would make them exactly like our government, who's very good at spending other people's money and then taking credit for it. That's not extraordinary. That's what organizations have been doing as long as there have been organizations. And they could have done, well, exactly what everybody else does. And no one would be inspired by that. But in this moment, what seemed to be wasteful, impulsive, actually had eternal value, inspiring a similar response in millions of other people since that moment. But I was walking in the woods on my day off this week, and this message began to stir in my spirit. Because I realized that so often we are guilty of the same thing. How often are we in a rush to get back to our routine, our mundane. And so we miss out on our extraordinary moments. In church, we're all in a rush to leave service, to get back to what? Chores? A meal? Got news for you. You'll be hungry again in a few hours. We just, we're in such a rush to get back to the mundane. We have no extraordinary moments at the feet of Jesus because we're so busy wanting to get back to our ordinary lives, to do the same stuff that'll be there tomorrow, the same chores that we'll repeat. In a few more days, the same routines that we do every other day. In our marriages, we often miss out on extraordinary moments of passion and connection because we're busy thinking about the laundry that needs to get done or some sporting event we want to follow that means exactly nothing in the big scheme of life. In our own alabaster box moment, we can't commit to the exceptional because we're so focused on the practical. We get so focused on working to provide for our families that we never take time to actually enjoy any extraordinary moments with our families. Time and again, we are driven to rush back to the mundane, the routine that saps our energy and numbs our joy. We just don't feel like we have time for the extraordinary. Why? I think the biggest cause is that in those moments, we cannot see the value of the extraordinary. Hindsight, as you know, is twenty twenty. Remember that the same gospel writers outside of Luke, Matthew, Mark, John, they are recording, when they record what the disciples did, their dismay over this waste of money, They're reporting on what they said. It was their reaction in the moment. And in that moment, that's exactly how they felt, how wasteful it was. And later on, they're the ones that were writing about the value of this moment. After Calvary, after Jesus is no longer with them in person every day, they realize the truth of what Jesus said. By Acts chapter 6, very on in the early church, The poor were fussing over discrimination in the handouts. They're mad because certain people they feel like are being neglected and they're missing out. And so they had to appoint new leaders just to take care of what they called the daily distribution. Jesus said, the poor are always with you. And they discovered, well, that's true. He's right. You see, before Calvary, 
They would have piously argued over the virtue of distributing the money to the poor, but now they realize. Look at Acts chapter 6 and verse 2. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. You note that change? They are recognizing that they need to spend less time in the mundane and spend more time in the extraordinary. They're not proposing to neglect the poor or those tasks that do need to get done. They were setting up the structure for that. But they were realizing we've got to be a little bit more like Mary, anointing the feet of Jesus. We need to do the big stuff to take those extraordinary moments to connect with Him. What our world needs is not just another group of managers that can distribute. But what they need uh, is people that can have extraordinary moments uh, with Jesus and inspire others to do the same. How many business people have worked endlessly, never feeling like they have time to take it off for their families or even a vacation. And then they get to the end of their careers and they realize it wasn't worth it. They chase the endless goal And realize that it had no value in the end. Who's looking back and saying, you know, I have one regret in life. I wish I had spent less time with my family. You're not hearing that. Who in eternity is going to look back and say, you know what, I have one regret. I wish I had spent less time in the altar seeking Jesus. Or I wish I had spent less time in prayer and more time vacuuming. I wish I had spent less time with my wife and more time on Netflix. I wish I had invested less in my marriage. No, those are not the regrets that people have. I'm at the time of life where my favorite moments are when my kids are home. I'm already processing the grief of Ryan moving away. And I'm thankful, not because I'm full of regrets over the way that we had our time with our family. I'm thankful our family did spend a lot of time together. And I don't have a lot of regrets over our lives together, but I can see how precious already uh, that those moments were. And I'm just about to the place uh, where that window has closed. Uh, and those moments, the way that it used to be, uh, they're in the past, uh, and I can't go and bring them back into the present. Uh, and if all of that time uh, I had missed all the opportunities to spend quality time with them. There are moments that I could never get back. I've been serving God my entire life to this point. And I can look back at some wonderful, wonderful time spent in His presence. But if I was looking back at this point, saying, I wish that I had given my life to God when I was younger, I wish that I had spent time when I had youth and energy doing something for the kingdom of God. Doesn't matter what I might wish in the present. Those days have passed. But you know what's still around? Floors that need vacuuming. Lawns that need cutting. Poor who need the help. Those tasks that are a part of the mundane part of existence, they are always with us. But those precious, extraordinary moments, they are fleeting. In the middle of the rat race, it can be hard to see the value of the extraordinary. The cost seems too high. You say, well, it's not practical. I can't mentally release the demands of the mundane enough to imagine spending an hour in the altar with Jesus. No, I need to get home. But what exactly am I in a rush to get home to? Is it something of greater value than time spent at the feet of the Master? Remember, the poor are with you always. They'll always be more clothes to fold. 
more lawns to mow, more bills to pay. But the extraordinary moments in life are fleeting. Don't miss the extraordinary for the mundane. Sometimes you have to take out that alabaster flax. And instead of saying, well, I'm going to give the Lord the little pinch off the top. I need to break the neck off of that. Saying it's all or nothing. I'm going to pour it all out to you right now, Jesus. I'm going to give you something extraordinary. And one thing I can assure you, you never give Jesus something extraordinary without receiving something even more extraordinary in return. I want to challenge us here tonight, and I'm drawn to a close. I'll invite the music to come back. But as I was studying and thinking about these things, I was sitting writing, and the tears were flowing down my face, thinking about these moments that God wants to give us. And one of the things that I think is a curse of the modern church is that we have convinced ourselves that we are just so busy We always have something that we need to get to. And I see end of services, so many people that are just in a rush. I don't know what they're going to do. But I feel with absolute confidence it's not more important than what's happening right here. It's not going to change their lives like what happens right here. It's not going to impact their families like what's happening in God's presence. Let's not have a Judas mindset where all we can see is the mundane and the stuff that needs to get done. But God help us to open our hearts and our calendars and our wallets the extraordinary things that God wants to do in our lives. Will you stand with me tonight? I want to invite you to come and to have a little time at the feet of Jesus here tonight. To come to Him and say, Lord, help me in my heart, oh God, to not be pulled by the rush of the ordinary. But God, I pray, Lord, that I would have an openness to the extraordinary that you want to do in my life tonight. In Jesus' name, help me, oh God. I pray.